Welcome to the Barrow Bookstore audio series. Henry David Thoreau's Notes on the Railroad From Walden, Chapter 4, Sounds As I sit at my window this summer afternoon, hawks are circling about my clearing. The tent V of wild pigeons flying by two and threes athwart my view, or perching restless on the white pine boughs behind my house, gives a voice in the air. A fish hawk dimples the glassy surface of the pond and brings up a fish. A mink steals out of the marsh before my door and seizes a frog by the shore. The sedge is bending under the weight of the reed birds flitting hither and thither, and for the last half hour I have heard the rattle of railroad cars, now dying away, and then reviving like the beat of a partridge, conveying travelers from Boston to the country. For I did not live so out of the world as that boy who, as I hear, was put out to a farmer in the east part of the town, but ere long ran away and came home again, quite down at the heel and homesick. He had never seen such a dull and out-of-the-way place. The folks were all gone off. Why, you couldn't even hear the whistle. I doubt if there is such a place in Massachusetts now. In truth, our village has become a butt for one of those fleet railroad shafts, and o'er our peaceful plain its soothing sound is conquered. The Fitchburg Railroad touches the pond about a hundred rods south of where I dwell. I usually go to the village along its causeway and am, as it were, related to society by this link. The men of the freight trains who go over the whole length of the road bow to me as to an old acquaintance. They pass me as often and apparently they take me for an employee. And so I am. I too would fain to be a track repairer somewhere in the orbit of the earth. The whistle of the locomotive penetrates my wood summer and winter, sounding like the scream of a hawk sailing over some farmer's yard, informing me that many restless city merchants are arriving within the circle of the town, or adventurous country traders from the other side. As they come under one horizon, they shout their warning to get off the track to the other, heard sometimes through the circles of the towns. Here come your groceries, country, your rations, countrymen. Nor is there any man so independent on his farm that he can say them nay. And here's your pay for them, screams the countryman's whistle. Timber like long battering rams going twenty miles an hour against the city walls, and chairs enough to seat all the weary and heavy laden that dwell within them. With such huge and lumbering civility, the country hands a chair to the city. All the Indian Huckleberry Hills are stripped, all the cranberry meadows are raked into the city. Up comes the cotton, down goes the woven cloth. Up comes the silk, down goes the woolen. Up come the books, but down goes the wit that writes them. When I meet the engine with its train of cars moving off with planetary motion, or rather like a comet, for the beholder knows not if with that velocity and with the direction it will ever revisit this system, since its orbit does not look like a returning curve, with its steam cloud like a banner streaming behind in golden and silver wreaths, like many a downy cloud which I have seen high in the heavens, unfolding its masses to the light, as if this traveling demigod, this cloud compeller, would ere long take the sunset sky for the livery of his train. When I hear the iron horse make the hills echo with his snort like thunder, shaking the earth with his feet and breathing fire and smoke from his nostrils, what kind of winged horse or fiery dragon they will put into the new mythology, I don't know. It seems as if the earth had got a race now worthy to inhabit it. 
if all were as it seems, and men made the elements their servants for noble ends, if the cloud that hangs over the engine were the perspiration of heroic deeds, or as beneficent as that which floats over the farmer's fields, then the elements and nature herself would cheerfully accompany men on their errands and be their escort. I watch the passage of the morning cars with the same feeling that I do the rising sun, which is hardly more regular. Their train of clouds stretching far behind and rising higher and higher, going to heaven while the cars are going to Boston, conceals the sun for a minute and casts my distant field into the shade, a celestial train besides which the petty trains of cars which hug the earth is but the barb of the spear. The stabler of the iron horse was up early this winter morning by the light of the stars amid the mountains to fodder and harness his steed. Fire, too, was awakened thus early to put the vital heat in him and get him off. If the enterprise were as innocent as it is early, if the snow lies deep, they strap on his snowshoes, and with the giant plow, plow a furrow from the mountains to the seaboard, in which the cars, like a following drill barrow, sprinkle all the restless men and floating merchandise in the country for seed. All day the fire steed flies over the country, stopping only that his master may rest and I am awakened by his tramp and defiant snort at midnight when in some remote glen in the woods he fronts the elements encased in ice and snow, and he will reach his stall only with the morning star to start once more on his travels without rest or slumber. Or perchance at evening I hear him in his stable blowing off the superfluous energy of the day that he may calm his nerves and cool his liver and brain for a few hours of iron slumber. If the enterprise were as heroic and commanding as it is protracted and unwearied. Far through unfrequented woods on the confines of towns where once only the hunter penetrated by day in the darkest night dart these bright saloons without the knowledge of their inhabitants. This moment stopping at some brilliant station house in town or city where a social crowd is gathered, the next in the dismal swamp scaring the owl and fox. The startings and arrivals of the cars are now the epics of the village day. They go and come with such regularity and precision, and their whistle can be heard so far that the farmers set their clocks by them, and thus one well-conducted institution regulates a whole country. Have not men improved somewhat in punctuality since the railroad was invented? Do they not talk and think faster in the depot than they did in the stage office? There is something electrifying in the atmosphere of the former place. I have been astonished at the miracles it has wrought, that some of my neighbors, who I should have prophesied once for all, would never get to Boston by so prompt a conveyance, are on hand when the bell rings. To do things railroad fashion is now the byword and it is worth the while to be warned so often and so sincerely by any power to get off its track. There is no stopping to read the riot act, no firing over the heads of the mob in this case. We have constructed a fate, an arapos, that never turns aside. Let that be the name of your engine. Men are advertised that at a certain hour and minute these bolts will be shot toward particular points of the compass. Yet it interferes with no man's business, and the children go to school on the other track. We live the steadier for it. We are all educated thus to be sons of tell. The air is full of invisible bolts. Every path but our own is the path of fate. Keep on your own track, then.